Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconer video. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about kind of a fun subject. We're going to be comparing the quail hawking abilities of the Cooper's Hawk and the Alpamato Falcon and kind of give you my thoughts on the uh, pluses and minuses of each species in that cause and which one I would go with if I had to put it down to one. Uh, but before we jump into that, if you haven't already, if you could please hit subscribe, it really does help me keep this channel up and going. And uh, with that, let's talk about these two amazing species. I've talked about them before on the channel, but I want to go into the context of quail hawking, which is where I think they both really shine. Uh, but first, we need to just address the species as what they are, as the individual species they are. So a Cooper's hawk is an occipiter. The occipiter is, of course, the group of hawks, that, the, the true hawks that live in forests. They are um, usually defined especially by having very short, rounded wings and a very long tail. Uh, the shorter and rounder your wings, uh, the easier it is to dodge branches and tree trunks, and the longer your tail, the more maneuverable you are. In the United States, we have three occipiters. We have the largest is the northern goshawk, which is a circumpolar species. We have subspecies of the northern goshawk all throughout the northern part of the northern hemisphere, including here in the United States. Uh, in the middle, you have the Cooper's hawk, which is, of course, the bird we're talking about. And then the smallest is the sharp shin hawk. Uh, which looks very much like a miniature Cooper's hawk, both in its juvenile and adult colors. So uh, these occipiters, these true hawks, are tenacious hunters. They never give up. They have so much speed and agility. And that is, of course, the case with Cooper's hawks. Now, Cooper's hawks themselves, genetic studies have been done to try to really see where do they fit in the family tree of occipiters. And even though they look more like a sharp shinned hawk, like a giant sharp shinned hawk, it turns out they have a common ancestor with the northern goshawk and occasionally even in the wild have been known to hybridize with northern goshawks this has been seen and every every few years bird banders will you know have caught one and be like oh look at this wow you know and it's really amazing to see this hybrid so why do i mention that i just mentioned that because it's a little bird with a big attitude you know, it may not be goshawk size, but it sure thinks it is when it comes to interacting with you, the falconer. So uh, Cooper's hawks are very long-legged, long, lurpy, gangly legs that are good for chur -chur, reaching out and grabbing. They're actually very fast on the ground. And when they chase something into the brush, they will go down on the ground and, and run around and charge in and chur -chur, go after things. So they're very much a, not only an aerial hunter, but a ground hunter. In the wild, you usually see them like maybe, okay, maybe they're sitting hiding in a tree, watching uh, from a neighbor's yard, watching your bird feeder. Birds come to the bird feeder and they jump out, catch one, sit on the ground, mantle over, and then go hide into the brush or carry it off to a tree. They're ambush predators. They're not uh, built for like the big long chase. They can do some long chases, but that's not what they're built for, okay? And that's true of occipiters. All occipiters, even if an individual can do a long chase, they do better for ambush. Like, I'm going to wait and I'm going to charge out and catch and do a very athletic short flight is kind of what you expect from occipiters, including Cooper's hawks. So that's just a little bit before we're talking about uh, their quail hawking abilities. So now let's jump back to the Aplomato falcons. Aplomato falcons are breathtakingly gorgeous. Both their juvenile and adult plumage is just... Hey, I'm an artist... I, I paint. I, I paint, I I carve, I sculpt, I do all kinds of medium. And so n color, beauty, uh, definition, when I'm looking at nature, the Aplomato is some is a species that has always inspired my heart and my artistic sensibilities. And it's not a surprise. You look at them and the, the colors, the mallard stripe, just everything about them is, is gorgeous. They are very similar in size to a Cooper's Hawk. But let's back up a little. Falcons in general. Uh, Size-wise, you have to say the Aplomato is like one of the smallest of the big falcons or one of the biggest of the small falcons. They're that interesting size that coincides with the Cooper's Hawk. Big falcons, when we're talking about them normally, we say, okay, a falcon is an open country bird. It has long, narrow wings and that are so narrow that it has to flap non-stop. It really can't glide for more than a few seconds. You know, if it's circling up on a thermal, it'll set its wings a bit. Okay, that's a little different, but they're not really built for soaring. They're built for non-stop uh, pumping action of their wings. Most falcons are said to have, you know, fairly long tails. 
uh, and fairly short legs. Falcons are normally considered to have fairly short legs because usually when they are hunting, they're going to dive and knock something out of the sky. And so having shorter legs allows you to deliver impact to the prey and have the prey absorb that impact rather than the length of your tibia and fibula uh, in your leg. And so usually we say that about falcons. Apomatos break those rules. Apomato falcons, they do have long, narrow wings, but they're less narrow. They're a bit broader for their size than uh, any other falcon would have if they were shrunk or enlarged to that same size. They're a bit more rounded. So they are able to do a bit more gliding and to get more lift uh, than a similarly sized falcon. Their tail is ridiculously long. It's huge for a falcon that size. Again, remember the rule is typically longer the tail, the more maneuverable and agile you are. And their legs are also, for their size, ridiculously long. Lurpy, gangly legs, again, very similar to a Cooper's hawk. And this is an unusual bird. The Apomato falcon is a South American, Central American, Mexican species that barely pushes its range up into a few states in the United States. But really, you need to think of it as South, Central, and Mexico American bird, right, is what it is. Now, one of the odd things about this species is if you, the more you get to know an apomato, even without working with them, is you look and you're like, well, where do they, where do they fit in? Where do they fit into all this whole kind of taxonomy? And if you look at who lives near them, you can look at a bat falcon and be like, oh, I see some color and marking similarities. That's sizing down. And if you look sizing up, at the orange-breasted falcon, you'd be like, oh yeah, again, oh. So maybe just like you got a goshawk, cooper's hawk, sharpshinned hawk, maybe it's kind of like that. You got these kind of related species of orange-breasted falcon, apomato falcon, and bat falcon. Nope, it's not closely related to them at all. Uh, DNA studies have been done, and their closest relative is the New Zealand falcon. Uh, New Zealand uh, ha currently only has two truly diurnal species of raptor. One is the New Zealand falcon, and the other one is the uh, swamp harrier. It's a type of, uh, um, you know, harrier, which is a raptor that I've done another video on. And that's it. That's, I mean, there's, there's, there's an owl or two there, but um, basically the diurnal predatory roles are just filled by these two birds for all of New Zealand. Uh, and, and so diurnal predatory raptorial role, uh, they're used, there's some extinct species there too, but I'm getting off track. The New Zealand falcon and the Apomato falcon. At first you look at them, you're like, huh? You know, you're almost like green and brown and stuff and you're all this bright orange. But if you ever get a chance to see them close, hold them and work with them, their attitude, you start to see, oh yeah, you can see it. You can experience it. New Zealand falcons the same way, uh, you know, Long, narrow wings, but less narrow and more rounded than other falcons its size. Ridiculously long tail, very agile, long, lurpy, gangly legs that don't match up what you would expect for a falcon. Uh, very prone to direct pursuit chases, as is the Aplomato. Um, and one of the most interesting things of all, <clears throat> New Zealand falcons and Aplomato falcons both prefer to hunt with their mate. They prefer to hunt in, in, as a pair. They're like, hey, this is our territory. Oh, we're kind of, we're hunting together and we're just wandering around and hunting and we land in a tree. Oh, there's so you're chasing this. Okay, well, I found something. We're chasing this. They both love to do that in the wild as well as you can train them that way as well, which is very unusual. We normally talk about hunting in, you, you've, you've got birds that, um, usually birds hunt on their own. Harris hawks are an exception where they hunt in a pack, even in the wild. And there are a few birds that will, you know, kind of hunt together as a pair. But for Apomatos and New Zealand falcons, it's very much a thing in the wild. And that's unusual. It's, that's not just a cast, a mated pair. Like, hey, we spend all day, we're just going around hunting together. That figures into your training, which I will get to in a second. But so you have the Cooper's hawk. And you have the Apomato falcon, which comes from a lineage that couldn't be further from a Falcons, falcons are 
generally generally open country birds that want to dive from thousands of feet that want to use their momentum to carry them through rather than the flapping action that's what a falcon should be but that's not what an apomato is an apomato is a very cooper's hawk like bird so here my experience uh i'm in utah we cannot get apomatos from the wild nor do we have them from the wild here um growing up captive bred apomatos weren't readily available. I've flown many Cooper's Hawks over the years before I got my first apomato. And so here's what I loved and did not love about hunting with Coopers on quail. And I gotta, I gotta preface this too. There's a general rule that we often tout. You know, we don't always follow up, but we tout it. And we say a falconer will have the most success if you hunt a species native to your area and you hunt it on prey that is native to your area and is prey that this species normally goes after in the wild and that that prey species is abundant in your area. So for me, that was Cooper's Hawk. I had, grew up having lots of quail, uh, California quail, Gamble's quail, just readily available, easy to hunt in huge coveys uh, in scrub oak forests. So you got these little, you know, five to 10 foot trees in the foothills. And it's like, okay, I'm going to get a Cooper's Hawk. I'm going to train it. And we go out and we're going to catch quail. Huge success. Just because again, using that formula, that sort of rule and boy, incredible. So the pluses of a Cooper's Hawk, once you have them properly trained and you have them dialed in to the right weight, they will hunt all day, every day. If you give them all day, every day, they will hunt and hunt and hunt and hunt and hunt. You have prey, they'll go after it. And quail are perfect. Quail are just the perfect match to quickly get up and catch them. It's an athletic hunt. You grab them, and then a Cooper's Hawk is just big enough that it is difficult for a quail to, to struggle. Where I did a recent video comparing sharpshins to merlins on quail, and that was one of the points I brought up. Sharpshins can easily catch a quail, but they have a difficult time holding on. A goshawk can easily catch a quail, not as easy as a coops, but easy. But that's kind of overkill. You know, it's fine to do, but it's like your goshawk might like fly <laughs> off of it. Where a cooper's hawk is like, yes. I got, I got this. Uh, so that's a plus. I just think it's a perfect wed of predator and prey. Uh, so, so what are some of the drawbacks? Uh, some of the drawbacks are Cooper's Hawks. The, it is good. They will crash the brush, meaning it is. They are willing to, oh, the quail went directly into this bush. I'm going to dive in after it, run around on the ground, go after it. It will do those things. But the bad thing is, is being that reckless in where quail hawking often requires a lot of kind of reckless hunting style where they're crashing through and that can have feathers break. Accipiters have very loose, flexible feathers and yet they're brittle. Accipiters, including Cooper's hawks, are highly prone to breaking their feathers. Happens all the time. That's a pain because you want your bird to have the proper feathers and be able to use them to hunt. And you can imp feathers, uh, which I've done videos on, on how you repair a feather that is broken. But it's it's kind of a pain to do. And it, it's it's it, the, the better thing to do is to just try to hunt in a way that you don't have broken feathers. But if the Cooper's Hawk is so excited and aggressive and reckless that it breaks its own feathers, what can you do? Another problem is aggression issues. Uh, there are huge differences with your Cooper's Hawk depending on did you trap it as a migrating passage bird? Did you get it as a family bird You know, a few days after it left the nest? Did you get it as a brancher running around the nest? Did you get it as a fluffy baby a few days old? All of those will result in a very different bird with different problems and that is not my point. My point is any of those ha situations have certain situations where extreme aggression can develop. Um, so I would just simplify that in this assessment of the two species to say managing aggression is a factor when choosing a bird, when choosing a Cooper's Hawk. You know that you're going to have to do some extra thinking that you might not have to do with another bird like an Apomato. So you might have the world's greatest quail hunter, but what if you do something wrong and you have aggression issues where it's hopping off the quail and running and going after you? So that th those are the, the pluses and minuses. And I'll, one more I will say is that the disease aspergillosis is a disease that a lot of occipiters are very prone to. So that's really kind of the three main drawbacks I would say are 
with a Cooper's Hawk, even if you have the perfect quail hunting individual, uh, well, you know, I'm going to put a fourth. Uh, dialing in weight, we'll say first. Getting the weight really perfect to where you've got them at the right weight where they're not fat and they're like, yeah, let's really go hunting. Um, and, and, but then, you know, but that they are got enough ump that they're like, I'm going to go hunt and be active and, and building that muscle up, okay? So maybe that's the first one is really micro-hawking style dedication to to weight management. Uh, they're going to break some feathers if they're quail hawking, most likely, and that's not fun. Uh, managing aggression, no matter what age that Cooper's hawk is, you have to watch for it, be aware of it, and it might surface, and you're, you're going to have to be way more attentive. And then, of course, lastly, is the potential for aspergillosis, which quail hawking or not, whatever you're hunting and is sipping or on, you have to be mindful of aspergillosis being a potential danger. So those are the drawbacks. Everything else is good. They're highly athletic. They're aggressive towards quarry they are willing to crash into the brush to get the prey and like i said you could hunt quail all day every day and just bag quail non-stop and have success so let's flip that compared to an apomato falcon when i finally had the chance to get an apomato captive bred uh, we fly in the united states we fly the peruvian subspecies the southern one because the northern uh you know, subspecies and population that's a bit different in color and size is locally listed in the United States as being an endangered species. And it's recognized uh, or declared by the government as being separate and in need of protection, which is all fine and dandy, but that means the southern, the Peruvian ones, are therefore the southern subspecies and are not endangered. So we have them captive bred. So I got my first Apomato, and my biggest excitement, I was like, okay, this is a Cooper's Hawk in Falcon form. Uh, so I'm going to lose those problems. I'm going to have no break. The feathers will be far less breakable. Uh, uh, Cooper's Hawks also, by the way, I forgot to mention, Accipiters don't lend themselves well to hooding. You can train an occipiter to hood, but I've pretty much stopped. I always did all over these years. And then when I started to have some individuals that legitimately did resent it, I'm like, you're an occipiter. Okay, no problem. The importance is the relationship. I will transport you unhooded on a perch or in a travel box that is dark and we're good. Uh, so I thought, hey, this is a falcon. I'll be able to hood it. Oh, this will be, make things way more easier. So less feather breaking. Uh, I'll be able to hood it. I'll be able to have no aggression issues that you would have with a, you know, with with an occipiter. I'm like, and you don't have the aspergillosis issues. This is going to be great. And I just was overlaying mentally the idea of what a falcon is onto this bird. <clears throat> and it, it was eye-opening to see just how different they really are mentally and in every way. And it was interesting, everything I had read about and talked with falconers overseas who have flown captive bred New Zealand falcons, it almost all lined up exactly. All the frustrations, all the bad things. So the good thing about <clears throat> Apomatos, they can handle the heat. They can handle extreme heat. So if that's an issue in your area, they can still fly in that. Uh, in fact, a lot of people utilize them for, um, uh, when they, they'll get a contract to for depredation where they'll be like, hey, Here's a wine vineyard, and they will hire a falconer to take a bird and, you know, chase at, chase off the, uh, you know, blackbirds and stuff that are coming to eat the grapes. And they're doing that in the spring and summer, even when it's like the the plants are growing, they need protection. And uh, Alpamato can handle that, which is really cool. So they can handle the heat uh, when they want to hunt. They have abilities that are similar to a Cooper's Hawk. They are very flash and dash, extremely maneuverable and agile. They are willing to crash the brush. They don't hunt on the ground as readily as a Cooper's Hawk will. You remember I mentioned a Cooper's Hawk's willing to, you know, oh, I'm going to run in the brush. An Alpamata will do that to some degree, but not as much as a Cooper's, but they still will. But more importantly, it's just the, their tenacity and their willingness to just pursue until they catch that prey. But <clears throat> one of the problems is that, uh, well, I guess we'll just jump right into the problems. You got all a lot of the good of a Cooper's Hawk, but here's some of the bad. They do not hood well. Uh, hood training, they're, it's, it's just very strange. I have never had an Oplomato that would hood well. I have had a couple that I did train to do so, but I ended up just being like, this is not, this is not good for our relationship and stopping, just like an occipiter. So I did not gain that. Um, their feathers do seem more breakable to me, their tail feathers, than 
other falcons, other large falcons, but nowhere near to as bad as a, as a Cooper's hawk. So that is so that is a plus. So you do have a bird with a bit more resilient, uh, more bendable feathers that can ha handle that kind of impact. Um, they are strangely motivated. And I didn't fully understand this until I talked to some of the depredation hunters. They are strangely motivated by fun and social interaction. And let me tell you what I mean. Sometimes you have them at what should be the right weight. Like, hey, you're you're this is a hunting weight. At this weight yesterday, you were in the game and you were like pursuing quarry. And today you're like, uh. what I found out from uh, several falconers who've done depredation is that that idea of like, hey, I where's my mate? We're gonna go out fly and hunting together. That's a factor. And what is your mate doing? And so they fly better. Many people have reported to me if you fly them as a pair. I have not had the chance to do that. One of the things that was also shown was uh, one of my buddies, you know, if he called them, they wouldn't come. But if he just walked away and just started chucking a stick and just like looking like he was doing something interesting, whoo, suddenly they would come over almost like a Harris hawk where Harris hawks, oh, the pack's going, we got to go over there. And him actually calling them to the glove, to the lure wasn't happening. But if he just walked away, then they were starting to do that. So that's interesting. That's very different. They are not, even though they can hunt prey in a direct pursuit, that it's not so much like you would think with a Cooper's Hawk. Cooper's Hawk is sitting, waiting. And if prey appears, well, I'm going after it. And then if you transfer that to your fist, okay, the perch is my fist, we're walking along. And I know where the quail are, so I'm walking you unknowingly to the quail. They flush up, whoo, you go after them. Uh, the, in the wild, Ophelmatos are far more like, oh, hey, me and my mate, we're just kind of wandering. Maybe we're in a country where there's trees. Maybe we're in country where there's yuccas or agaves or saguaro cactus or um, uh, Joshua trees where there's these kind of desert trees and open country, desert tree, open country. And we're going to fly over to this. What's going on? Huh? And okay, maybe we're going to catch a quail. Maybe, oh, maybe I caught a dragon flying. Am I eating it while I'm flying around, dinking around? And then maybe, ooh, maybe we both tackle a little cottontail rabbit together. I mean, it's just kind of like moving, going together and looking for things. That's very different than the mentality of a still hunt which you can transfer that still hunting idea to you on your glove or you with a carrying tea perch. So that I was very shocked by, that uh, dialing in an Oplomato Falcon was much more difficult than I had thought. So really both of these birds um, have a lot going for them and they have a lot of strange drawbacks. And if I, said, if I were to think that, that maybe the two or three biggest things the two biggies on Cooper's Hawks are managing aggression. You do it wrong. You've got an aggressive bird that you don't want to be around. And it was just a waste. And, of course, the feather breaking. But especially the managing aggression things. With Oplomatos, yeah, I mentioned things like the hood and stuff. But the biggest thing I think that is a drawback for people is the dialing them in. Uh, everybody, even the most successful Oplomato flyers I have known have mentioned like, oh yeah, you know, it's like why, you know, I'm right at the mark where this should be the right weight, we have the right training, we had a great day two days ago, and today, same weight, same conditions, same prey flushes, and they're kind of like, huh, huh, and you can't figure it. So dialing them in is a constant um, reassessment, a constant fine-tuning and troubleshooting through things when you're flying an Oplomato. Uh, just the difference is with a Cooper's Hawk, that sort of fine-tuning goes to managing aggression, and with an Oplomato, that kind of fine-tuning goes towards motivation, motivation to pursue prey in the way that you want. Uh, they're pretty close to a Cooper's. If you have them dialed in and their ga A game is on, they are pretty close in their uh, abilities to catch quail as a Cooper's Hawk. So, all of those things. My personal opinion, if you said, Ben, your goal is to pursue quail and have a lot of success. Which species are you going to choose? For me, I would choose Cooper's Hawk. Uh, if that was my only goal, okay? Um, if, if, if I had I just want to demonstrate or have a lot of quail to eat or whatever, I would choose the Coopers. And I would probably get either a passage bird or a family bird, you know, where they had just left the nest and the parents are still in the area. That's probably what I would choose. But 
I would only fly a Cooper's Hawk. Nothing else. Um, Cooper's Hawk is my favorite hawk to fly. I do not have one because I have other birds. And that's my personal mantra is no more. I just, I will never fly a Cooper's Hawk unless it's the only bird I can dedicate my time to. Now, I'm an older falconer. I've been doing it for a long time. And so if my sole goal was not quail, but it was just like, hey, you want to have a rich experience. You want to learn. You want to expand yourself as a falconer and, and, and learn new skills and new approaches. And you're supposed to hunt quail. Which are you going to choose? I would choose the aplomato. Also, if it's just a species you're passionate for. If you love aplomatos, and it's hard not to fall in love with them, but if it is a species that really drives your passion for the sport, then get an aplomato. And yeah, you're going to have to do a lot of troubleshooting to work through some of those behavioral issues where you're like, okay, I got a bird that wants to constantly be on the move, almost as bad as a harrier. Not quite, but almost as bad. I want to always be on the move, not, okay, flush something for me. All right, I'm going after it. And and they're, they're wired to be hunting with their mate and you only have them. How do you shape that in a way that gives them success? How do you shape that in a way that utilizes their mental wiring rather than fights against it? That's a challenge that is achievable and one that is very rewarding if you love the species. So again... If the only goal was to get quail, I'd go with the Coopers. And if my goal was to have a rich experience that expands my mind even further at this point where I'm at in my journey personally, I would go with another Aplomato. So those are my thoughts. Uh, there is a lot of experience and there is a lot of range with Aplomatos uh, depending on which region they are flown. So if you're watching this video and you have flown either of these species, especially on quail, uh, please leave some comments down below. Let us all know what your experience has been, what uh, negative things you've had happen, what positive things you have that I left out. Uh, please share all of that. And if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. And as always, happy hawking.